Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. My name is Matthew Renner, and today we're talking to an esteemed special guest. He would call me his uglier, older brother, <laughs> but obviously I am the younger, more handsome one. And uh, this is my brother, Solomon Brenner. And today we're going to talk about what it's like running a martial arts empire. And one of the things that people don't even realize is my brother, Solomon, runs this martial arts empire, and he's kind of like an unknown almost like you know some people know you like the biggest people know you but like i feel like you run kind of under the radar so he's going to talk about what it's like day-to-day -day running an empire the in the challenges that he deals with in the day-to-day -day, and what he sees as a vision of the martial arts industry so Saul, thank you thank you for coming on here my pleasure uh you're definitely better looking and younger so uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on this is the first time he's ever admitted that now that's on recording i can have that forever so since you first started can you tell us like a little bit about like your background and martial arts and how you first got started in it? And then we'll kind of fast forward to what's going on today. Yeah. So, so for my inspiration was I'm a product of the eighties martial arts movies, you know, Karate Kid, Best of the Best, you know, whatever movies came out during that. No Retreat, No Surrender, Blood Sport. And I just loved it and I thought it was awesome. And I just thought, you know, this is what I want to do. And I started when I was 14. At the time, it was mostly, you know, lots of, lots of adults and kids, but there weren't like a ton of like teenagers. So it was like me and one other person were the only teenagers, which was kind of cool because we were almost like the pets, I felt, of the instructors because we could, you know, we were like a little bit older so we can like do more stuff, but young enough that they could still mentor us and, you know, like, you know, kind of guide us. Mm. So... You started when you were 14. When did you discover, figure out that you were going to do this professionally as so a full-time career? Well, before full-time career, I mean, I always was like a business-minded person. Like I always enjoyed that kind of, you know, that part of the world. I decided to open when I was 19 with my partner. You know, we kind of saw what was going on in the industry and thought like, oh man, we could do this, you know, and, you know, kind of bring like a more of a business side to it and make it professional as much as we could. And, you know, we went to a ton of seminars, so I guess when I was 19, but I started working as an enrollment director when I was 16. Mm, okay, cool. So you worked in enrollment director. So where did you start? Like you didn't start with your own school. So tell us a little bit more about where you started. Yeah, this, the school that I started at, great school. And when I was 16, again, I kind of like the martial arts side of it. And because I hung out with the adults, you know, between 14 and 16, I happened to be in the room and one of the adults, somebody, the head instructor tried to hire them as the enrollment director, but he couldn't do it. And I was like, wait, I'll do it. And they said, oh, nobody's gonna buy from you. You know, you're too young. They're not gonna like take seriously like you helping them. And I said, all right, well, like teach me how to do it and I'll work for free. And if it works out, great. And luckily we have a mom who always says, you know, you work to learn, not to earn. And, you know, I always took that as like, of course, right? Like, and I said, hey, I'll work for a month. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, you don't have to pay me and fire me. It, you know, it doesn't make any, and I was teaching some classes. So I memorized the script and, you know, of course I memorized it like perfectly as best as I could. And then I went and did it and I turned out to be really good at it because I was super into following the system. Mm, okay, cool. And then from there, how did you end up opening your own school? Like how was that transition? How long did it take? 19, I met my partner, as you know, as Miss Jackie. And, you know, we just kept talking about like, you know, what the possibilities are. And I always wanted to be in business. If I didn't do that, I probably would be like a Wall Street analyst of some sort because, you know, I like that stuff. But I loved the way that martial arts made me feel. I loved what it did for my life. When I looked at all my peers, like I wasn't any smarter than anybody else, but I felt like I was a different kind of person because of what I was exposed through, like Tony Robbins type stuff. Like I thought a different way. And I thought like, hey, if we can help other, if we can help other people do the same thing and I can make money doing it. Like, wouldn't that be a fun life? And before that, I thought like wearing a suit to work would be super cool. Like, you know, I'd be like a Wall Street guy. But then when I realized what it felt like to wear a suit and, you know, they didn't have materials like they have now where everything feels so awesome, you know, wearing a suit every day lost its luster once I realized what that really meant. Mm. So then you open up your first school because you had experience teaching at another school and being a program director. Was it like success right away or is it, well, what did that, and obviously like for our parents, like they... Now that a child is running a martial arts school while I think you were in university at the time too, right? Like you went to St. Joe's University in yes, Philadelphia. Sir. So what was that like for the family? For I you? think mom and dad originally tried to talk me out of it. 
but we're, you know, like I said before, we're so fortunate to have the parents that we have that like once I said, well, this is what, we're, this is what I'm doing. They were a hundred percent supportive. You know, mom still talks about, she's my silent partner. And we, and it was definitely not successful from the beginning. I mean, there was lots of issues. Besides legal issues, we also had, you know, completely no money. I had a business, I had another business part that was, that was supposed to be the money and halfway through the build out called me and said, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. And just left me holding the bag. You know, we already had a signed lease and we were building out, we were marketing, we were flyer and we were doing all those, you know, getting ourselves in the community. So that was a disaster. Then once we started like actually enrolling people, this is no exaggeration. Somebody would enroll, we would celebrate the very next day on the membership agreement. It said at the time that if you want to cancel, you have to send a registered letter. Like in the next two or three days, we'd get a registered letter canceled. Somebody enroll, somebody would cancel every day. And I would come from school from, you know, from college and literally have a panic attack because I would get the mail when I got there and then somebody would quit again. And I didn't know what to do about it. Like I was having such an anxiety attack. Luckily, you know, I had good mentors at the time. Like, you know, Mr. Silva was in my life and Jacqueline, of course, was amazing. And I remember like I would lay down on a square hand target and want to go to sleep because I, I couldn't breathe. Like I didn't know what to do. Like I, I was now trapped in this situation. Um, and I remember Jacqueline specifically said, like, get up. Let's go, let's go find some students who actually want to do this. Don't worry about the person who just quit. We wound up like changing the membership agreement, changing our program, you know, changing how we did the enrollment a little bit. And then it finally clicked and worked, but it was really not like zero to success. It would be like the exact opposite of that. So your business partner, this is Jacqueline Razzai you're talking about, and you two co-founded Action Karate. So for, for you guys working together, did she have business experience or? No. She was a stay-at-home mom. She did have a realtor's license. And when we opened again, we had no money. I mean, like, like, you know, if we spent $5 on food for both of us combined, like a pizza and cheese fries, that's what we got a lot of times. You know, we'd have to like think if we were really going to spend that or not. And she worked part-time as a waitress. And no, so she had no business experience, but luckily she's just super smart. And I'm a good collector of knowledge and implementer of knowledge. Like I think that's one of our good skill sets is like finding the right people that have already done it, model it and just do it. You know, like we don't question it. We just do it. You know, if you've had a success, we'll just do the same thing. Mm. So I think we got really lucky that way. So your mentor, one of your mentors at the time was Mr. Silva. So Greg Silva, right? I think a lot yeah. of people who listen to this probably know who he is, right? Long time martial artist and, and, and friend. So after you opened your first location, how did you end up transitioning to multiple? Like how did that happen? Was that your vision or did that just happen? Definitely not the vision like the first maybe like year. You know, the first year was like, let's get to school to like pay the rent. And I remember Jack and I having a conversation that if we can make $5,000 a month profit combined, the world would be a good place. I mean, that was like, could you imagine? I mean, we had the conversation, I remember in the car, probably going to pick up our kids or go do flyers or something. We were both like, yeah, that'd be amazing. So in the beginning, that was it. But once we realized like, once we got to 300 active students and the school was really profitable, like we realized number one, gross revenue doesn't matter. We realized that, you know, even number of students didn't matter. What mattered is net. And most of the industry is all caught up in number of students and gross value. And I don't want to say those numbers don't matter, but at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is really net. So we really focused on that. And then once we did that, we realized we had something really special and we thought, all right, well, if we had, we read the e-myth, the e-myth was a game changer for us. If you haven't read the e-myth, read that. The idea is systematize everything that a 10 year old can do it. And I know it sounds silly, but that's exactly what we did. And we realized that, you know, we can do this with other people and, you know, make money doing it at the same time and help other communities and help people have better careers. So how did you find that first person to open up the second location? Was it a student, someone from the outside? I was actually, I think uh, one of the first ones was I was talking to somebody else and somebody else that was listening went, wait, what about me? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Let's talk about it. Mm. And then was there a difference between running one school versus helping someone else run another school? And what, what did that look like? Definitely a different skill set. You know, you have to like learn how to do that, learn how to pick the right people. The, I think the big part is learning how to train them and get their mindset right of one of your businesses. You know, I think everybody thinks of, oh, I own my own business, how glorious that is. But the reality is, you know, that running your own business just means you get to work any 24 hours a day that you choose, you know, especially in the beginning. So yeah, it was definitely harder. But I think we were also super good at systematizing it to where like once they were trained and going, just for me, 
I felt like, you know, once they had it, they had it. And then we just had to make sure that we kept it going. So we had, you know, meetings every week, we made sure that we cared about everybody. And we knew that they were, if the only way that we were successful is that they were successful. I mean, even though it wasn't a straight you know, it was a partnership, right? Like we, we looked at everybody, like they're only going to do well as if they do well. So they need happy students and we need them to be happy and successful. Mm, very cool. So now that you had that one location open, you know, eventually you would have to multiply it more from there, not have to, but you decided to, right? So as you multiplied to more locations, was it like, okay, we have the system, we have everything in place. This is like easy street or like what are some of the things that you ran into? I don't think anything is easy street. I think that's like a big myth. I think all of it is lots of hard work. You know, if you read the four hour work week, I love the concepts of it, but I think that that's a huge, you know, I, I don't know anyone personally who's wildly successful that actually works four hours a week. So I forget the question. Yeah. I was asking like what the challenges were that popped up during that time. Cause you had things systematized for one school and then maybe two, but eventually like you would grow to many more locations, right? So over, eventually you got to, like, I think 15, right? It was like the spot you got like 17, to. 17, I think. Or 17. Okay, so like, how did you do that? I think most people listening to this who run a martial arts school, they know usually that the tough part is not money or students. Usually the tough part is like people, right? So how did you get those people and what challenges did you run into to, to get into 17 locations? Like, that's wild. I think in the action karate world, when you say money isn't the issue, is 100% true. And that's because the world that, you know, we both, you know, orbit around for lots of school owners, you know, when they talk to me like, oh, how do I expand? One of the things they ask me is, oh, do you take a loan? Do you borrow money? Like, we've never done that. We only do that to buy buildings. So, you know, we have lots of debt from that, but not from, you know, the operations. So step one is always, I always say, well, go get your operation together so that money isn't an issue so that you can open, you know, other locations. And every step of the way is like a new set of skills that you need to develop. So again, I was always really good. Like I think one of, I'm not good at a lot of things, but what I am good at is finding someone else who's already done it, whether our industry or out of our industry, and then hunting them down and either, you know, taking them to lunch or to tea or calling them a thousand times or buying their time or whatever to learn, you know, the systems and the way to do it. And the issue is like you said earlier, it's always the people, right? Like if it's money, you need to fix your system. If it's time, you need to fix your system. The hardest part by far is finding the right people. But once you have the right people, it's totally magical. Mm, so how do you find the right people? It's not, I, I shouldn't have said it that way. That's what everybody says, finding the right people. It's really about, you actually taught me this, I think partly in dating, that it's not about, finding the right people. It's about you being the right person that you want to attract, right? You need to be like a magnet and you need to have you personally, right? Like, so somebody should look at you and, and I don't want this to sound like egotistical because that's not what this is, but people would need to want to be you, right? So like your health and fitness, your, you financially, your hours worked or business or your relationships, like they need, they, they need to see that in an authentic way. And then want be like, oh man, that looks like a good lifestyle. How do I get involved in that? That's how, you know, that's how you attract people. Not really like, I'm not really like looking for people. I'm more like trying to make sure that I am the person and I'm living the lifestyle. Maybe not exactly, but you know, the main things, right? Like freedom, money, inspiration, impact. Like I'm doing the things that they want to do. And if I'm doing that correctly, they're going to notice it. And if they don't notice it, and I think they're the right person, I'll try to make sure that I put them in a position to discover it. So I'm not really finding them. I'm being that. And then the, the, the goal is that they discover, you know, what we can do and they want to be part of it. Mm. So the funny part about that is like being the person that you want other people to be and inspiring others. Is that like for us, we do that, I think, for the most part in terms of like freedom, travel, lifestyle. I think the one area we don't do that is like we're not super flashy. It's just like not who we are. <laughs> Right. I think maybe we were raised that way from our parents, but like, you know, I drive a teenage girl starter car, right. Even though I could afford a much nicer car. I know I think you drive like a regular Mazda, right. Like, and it's funny because other people will, I don't think purposely judge us that way, maybe, but like, you know, they don't know, oh yeah, I own, you know, 14 commercial real estate spaces, right. They just see the car and think, oh, well, you can't afford a nicer car. Right. Uh, do you think we get that from our parents? I think it's just like who we are. 
I think we definitely get it. You know, our parents both came, you know, their parents came from depression slash Nazi Germany where you had nothing and you had to squirrel away everything. And I think that's been a blessing for us over time because, you know, we have financial security now because, you know, there was such a lack of, you know, at least a thought of, you know, our parent, you know, our father retired with nine children at 55. That's re- at, at, at a job that he worked for the city, you know, where it's not like he worked for some giant company, made tons of money. Like they were just super good at saving. And then we kind of inherited that. And the flashy part, we've had so many conversations with you and other partners like, all right, you know, so if we want it, if people, we need people to want to have our lifestyle, you know, we've talked about like, all right, let's all buy a Lambo. You know, it's not like we couldn't, right? Like, uh, let's, you know, let's get nice Teslas. Let's get, and then when the time comes to do it, like I have such, you, I just don't want to do it. Like, you know, we, you know, you have two nice Rolexes, you know, I have like a fancy watch or whatever, but first of all, I don't even wear my fancy watch. I just wear my iWatch now, but I felt like once I had some fancy, you know, I drove a bunch of Mercedes and stuff like that. Like once I think I had some of this stuff, I realized I didn't care like in, in any way. Like it was just like the car I drove made no difference to me. Like it was cool. Like, you know, the first 30 days, like I would get in, I would look around if anybody's looking at me. I remember when you got heated seats and I think that was like, whoa, now we're living in luxury. Yeah, right like, now every car's got that. But. Yeah. But like for me, like I want to be able to, re- you know, we're buying a building a January 15th, like another location, like writing the check for like the down payment for that. I don't want to say it's meaningless to me, but like. What's the check? How much are we talking? Uh, I mean, you know, the, the building's uh nine fifty, and we have a couple of partners in it. So it's, you know, it, we, the last building we bought together was 2.1, you know, so we each wrote a check for, you know, like a hundred or something like that. Like once the build out was done. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I mean, I think, I, I think that's a lot of money, but not a lot of money to us, you know, sure. and, but it's not because like part of that, we do well, but it's also part of that because we're good savers. Like people always ask me when we go places like, Oh, like, how do you buy a building? Like, wh- where do you get the money? You know, I don't go out to dinner a ton, you know, I probably go out once a week. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'm good at saving. You don't buy fancy clothes. Right? Most of the clothes are, are branded martial arts brand, you know, our brand. So, so to go back to, to where you were. So you got to 17 schools and then like, where are we at now? We're at 26 locations. That, and the, you know, for us, that's full time. Everybody has unlimited vacation. Everybody has, and it's not unlimited vacation. Like some corporations do where nobody takes vacation because they're you know afraid that it's going to look bad. Our people are on vacation as much as they want, whenever they want. We don't even know they're away some of the time. And you know, a lot of these people are partners, right? Like it's not like we own all the, you know, the equity in all these locations, you know, and, that's another model that I think for us is so important. If the issue is people, the, you need really good people, really need people need to get paid well, really need people also need opportunity to grow. So, ha- you know, having them part of the business and then wanting to grow more, I think is not, I think I know allows me to sleep at night. Like I know somebody's taking care of the business. And one of the things that we hear a lot from other people is if they own hundred percent of it, the challenge is if that person quits, what, you know, there's nothing there. There is no asset. So the, our assets are really, you know, people again, talk about the buildings, but our assets are really the people, the partners. So we're at 26 was your question. Plus, I think there's like three rec centers that the idea is they'll eventually turn into full-time locations. So I, the models changed over the years. At first it was like, don't give up equity ever. Right. And I think that was like, the not mo- us. We always did. And we did licensing from the beginning. We did licensing from the beginning. Right. But a lot of them were, we didn't necessarily do like partnerships like we, like we do now. And, and now that's transforming too into franchising. I think we'll get to that as well for people who want to be a part of like a bigger organization and, and have like support from a martial arts organization that's established and has all the systems. But I know for a while, like it was still, we, we wanted to have either uh, A, someone else own most of the equity or all the equity, or B, like you would own all the equity, like you'd open up a school, right? And now we've kind of transferred over the last, I don't know, four or five years to more like a partnership model. Can you talk about like why we did that and like what changes you've seen because we did that? I think, and it's hard to really get this, but after we did it for, you know, the first 20 years, we realized that straight licensing, one of the downsides is people take the approach of, well, this is my business. I'll do what I want. And when we owned them straight out, 
the success, not always, but a lot of, but some of the times was clearly better because they felt like they had to do what we said. Even though all, even though all of them were licenses, like they felt like, all right, we got to follow, we got to follow along because, you know, he's like the boss man. I mean, he owns the business, so we do what he says. And then what we kind of, but we also always wanted people to have that ownership stake. We wanted them to make more money. We wanted them to have skin in the game. You know, so for my side of it, I want them to have skin in the game. So they, you know, they stay, we want them long-term and have this amazing lifestyle. But they also, we also know, okay, well, most people love the idea of owning their own business and feeling that they're secure and they control their future. So it was like, if by being partners, I felt like we got the best of both worlds. We got the attitude of, we have to, we have to follow the model. And the model isn't ego-based, like, oh, I always want you to do it my way. The model is we messed up, spent hundreds and hundreds and, you know, so much money, fit, you know, messing up. Let's just not do the mess ups and do it right from the beginning. So we, you know, it, it, that's following the system to us. And we know for a fact the system works when somebody's working the system. Mm. And I think one of the things we always talk about when we talk about the systems with our staff is first you want to memorize, right? So first part is you memorize the script, just kind of like a recipe, right? If you're going to bake some lasagna, you don't just like make up how you think the lasagna is going to taste good, right? It would never come out good. So you memorize it and then you internalize it. So it becomes more of like your own, right? When you first memorize something and you just say like a script, it feels clunky, robotic, might feel uncomfortable. But after you do it for a while, eventually you can internalize it. It becomes more personable. And after you internalize it and do it a lot successfully, then you can personalize. Then you might add a little extra cheese to the lasagna or cook the sauce with, um, you know, a little extra oregano or something like that. And that's really been, I think, one of the things that's been so important for the continued growth is like that mindset of, okay, you can personalize and eventually, but first you got to memorize and internalize and do the system that we know works. Use the recipe that's been proven over and over and over again. So when now we're at 26 locations, a couple of rec centers that are, the goal is to be full-time, right? So now like for you, what do you feel like has changed from when you first started your martial arts entrepreneurial journey to where you are now? Like, How are you different or what skills are, are different for you now? So first, just like a mindset, I think it's Tony Robbins that said, when you teach someone how to become a millionaire, it's not about the money. And if you don't have a million dollars, of course, it seems like it would be about the money, but it's really who they become in the future. And that once they learn how to do it, they can do it again. And so like what you said is exactly right. Like, you know, we're just different people now than we were a year or two years or definitely five or six years ago. As far as systems go, since COVID, you know, we have the daily success platform where we have a meeting four days a week where it's, you know, if you're in the business world, it's like kind of like a stand-up meeting. It's like 30 minutes. This is what needs to get done. You know, every day there's a different topic. We have a book club for everybody and it's kind of getting everybody, you know, everybody starts at a different spot as far as their business knowledge, their martial arts knowledge. And we also know now that we can take, this is like my favorite thing. So the platform changed pretty much everything. And the, and the other thing that was a big driver for us is everybody always believes, and this is going to be controversial for those people that think like karate is somehow, you know, you have to have been doing it for 10 years in order to be an instructor, is for us to take a good person. And, when, you know, when I say a good person, somebody that's hungry, humble, smart, someone that wants to make an impact in their community, and we can teach them the martial arts side of it and the business side. And everybody always thought like the business side, oh, of course you can do that. But if you, you know, but if you looked at it, and made it equal to the karate side, then it would be like, well, you need your MBA, right? You need to get your MBA before you can start a business. But that doesn't make any sense. Well, you also don't need to know martial arts for 10 years in order to be a martial arts instructor. You need to learn the core concepts, the core basics, and then, you know, be training in martial arts and always be ahead of your students. But, you know, we've proven that model already that we've taken people that were, you know, executives that were, you know, advisors that were doing really well for themselves and said, okay, if we, you know, we can teach you the martial arts, we can teach you the business and you can live the dream life that you want and, you know, have a better life than you have now. So, you know, that has definitely changed for us, like having a platform to continue education, but also getting that mindset shift. I mean, all of this is a paradigm shift at the end of the day. Mm. So what did you do to train people quickly? Like I know we, everything we've done, I think over the years, and one of the one of the things I think you're so good at professionally is being willing to experiment and try new things, right? And 
you know, you have the systems in place and you run those recipes over and over again, but you're also willing to like, okay, let's try this thing. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I'm, I've had a lot of things that hasn't worked, right? Those things we don't talk about as much, maybe internally, right? We don't want to share with the world. But the things that do work are the things that like people will see in our industry and try to model or emulate. So like what, at some point we had like a spike of, of like new schools. And I think over the last, especially like maybe five or six years, you've been, you've been spiking. So what, what I guess shifted in your mind or what training process in order to train the martial arts had gave you the ability to have that spike and, and new growth? Well, first of all, you talked about the failures that we don't share. I think you share them all the time with your clients and we definitely share them with new schools. You know, when, that's one of the best things we have, right? Because when somebody comes in and says, you know, everybody has ideas in the beginning and their whole training, right? Like, oh, I think we should add this to the recipe. I think we should add that. For a, a lot of those things, we can say we did exactly that. Yeah, I, you know, we thought the same thing and here's how we messed up. And we're always looking to, to grow and improve and I also see other industries, you know, we don't just train or study, you know, ourselves or, you know, go to the martial arts seminars. We go to all kinds of stuff and part of, you know, masterminds like you have and, you know, we're part of other all kinds of stuff. And there are plenty of, you know, Sears, if anybody knows Sears, should be Amazon now. They're the exact same thing, but they're not, right? Like Kmart should have been Walmart, but it's not. Blockbuster should have been Netflix, but they're not. So at any point, like no matter how good we're doing, we could easily be the next story that they're teaching at, you know, an MBA course of like what not to do. So we're always looking and we always assume that, you know, there's something better out there and either we're going to be the better or somebody else is going to be the better. So we need to be, you know, we need that mindset of constantly growing. And like I said before, realizing that it's the right person not their martial arts talent. Like we can teach them the martial arts talent, but it's having that right person to grow and expand. Hmm. One of the things we were at this weekend was a uh, martial arts business seminar. We're at, we're at the uh, Relentless Membership Summit, right? And one of the speakers there was, I think his name is Jotty, right? And he had this quote that was so good. And then I, I wrote it down and it's been really like replaying in my mind. And it's that a lot of times we use, we, especially as martial artists, we're bullied by dead people. So essentially we're like handcuffed by tradition and think, oh, my instructor taught it to me this way, so I have to teach it that way. But the truth is training used to be different. Like 20 years ago, you would go to a class that would be at least an hour, a lot of times two hours, multiple days a week. So you'd be training four to six hours a week and you'd have tons of self-defense and katas and movements. And now... It's like, okay, people come maybe an hour a week, maybe an hour and a half, and you expect them to still learn all that curriculum, right? And it's just like, doesn't make sense. Like the lives are different. You're not still using the same flip phone than you did, that you did then as, as you do now, right? The technology has changed, so our mindset has to change. So I think like we've been kind of like ahead of the curve in that way of like, okay, why are we being bullied by these dead people in tradition? We need to adopt or adapt to what modern kids and modern families and modern people want, right? And what they can actually have in their bandwidth, right? Like people can't do train for four to six hours a week like the average person, right? Now, I think you can agree with this, kids do more than ever, right? I know you have a small daughter and she's already doing a bunch of stuff like gymnastics and swim. Like that didn't really happen like 20 years ago. Maybe did one, right? But now kids do piano, soccer, tennis, they do a million things, right? So as we move forward, in the future in the martial arts industry, is there anything else you've seen that's different then or what's different now than then in terms of like the consumer mindset? I mean, I think everything is different, right? Like even when we started, which was 28 years ago, you know, the you, you had less single parents. Now there's more single parents. You have to constantly look who your customer is now and who you want your customer to be. So the person we were doing enrollments with then are not, fundamentally, you know, just like, you know, simple thing with that's like obvious, like the way that you would join like a boutique fitness place now, like somebody your age is different than I would have joined. Like if you remember Bally's fitness, you know, back in the day, like, so now there might be like a QR code, you just join before you get there. You just like sign up for your class on your phone and you walk in and you do it. There's, you know, less of like the sales transaction and stuff like that. So I think what you have to just constantly try and see like what experiences your current so right now for us, your age group are the new parents. You know, they're not parents that are in their 50s or parents that are in their late 20s, early 30s. 
So we had to think, all right, so what did they do before they entered our school? You know, they probably went to rumble boxing. They probably went to soul cycle. How did that experience go? Well, they're going to want that same experience for their kids. And some of that is technology based. Some of that is, you know, you walk into those places, they're absolutely beautiful. You know, it's good. It's high end equipment. So do you have like really nice mats? Do you have good padding? You know, the uniform is nice. You know, they're used to, you know, when I grew up, you know, like sweatpants were a thing. I've never seen you in sweatpants. Like you're wearing like Lululemon types, you know, like the materials are just different and better. And, you know, it's the same thing. So we have to make sure that whatever experience they had in their, you know, their singles life, when they show up with their family now, they're expecting something in the same realm, not, you know, the old way of doing things. Like I would wear my sweatpants. <laughs> I think I still wear sweatpants, just like way nicer ones, <laughs> right? Like hundred dollars sweatpants. I'm like, ah, oh, these are the best But it was probably ever. better material. It wasn't just cost more. They were like, mine were Fruit of the Loomer or Henley or something. And you, again, yours would be similar to Lululemon or, you know, Fabletics or something. Mm. So now that we're at 26 schools and a couple of rec centers are developing the full time, what's your day-to-day -day look like? Like in terms of being the CEO, like you and your co-founder, Jacqueline Razar, are you guys just like chilling on the beach all day? Like what is happening in your life to manage all these locations? I think most people listening would probably be like, like almost dizzying to think, oh my God, like managing one location is difficult. I can't imagine running dozens. So what does your day-to-day -day look like? Like what's your role at this point? I consider my role to stay ahead of everybody else so that I'm constantly kind of like paving the way for them to have opportunity. So, you know, yet, you know, for an example, yesterday I was on the phone or in webinars or something like that, probably for five or six hours. I personally love that stuff. That's probably an extreme day of it, but a lot of what I'm doing personally is strategy. And then we have like Jacqueline and you and Sensei Michael and Mr. McCreary and people like that doing a lot of the like support of the instructors. Like they call me, but not as much you know, Hey, like this enrollment hat, you know, we have tons besides the meeting every day, we have tons of support. Like anybody has an issue with anything. If anything, we probably offer more support than they want. But like me personally, I am constantly in the next webinar, in the next mastermind, in the, you know, reading the next book, trying to figure out like where we're going next. So we don't wind up with one of those companies that doesn't exist anymore. And I try not to look at it that way as much. I try and look at it like, okay, we have all these school head instructors, partners, owners, how are we going to like make sure that there's like the easiest path for them to not have one school, but to have three schools or five schools, you know, Mr. Mercury, I think has six or seven, um, you know, you have a few, since Michael has a bunch, you know, um, you know, how do we make that path for them as easy as possible and create the learning opportunity for their instructors? You know, I probably our thing that makes us most unique besides all the mindset is and all the training is all the training that we do for our instructors. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that does more instructor development than we do. And more support. Without but, Like you can call anyone on any of the staff anywhere. You know, we have people who are former therapists or psychologists. We have former university professors, right? So I know if I have a, a question about a student needs child, like, like, uh, or one of my instructors does, like, don't ask me. Like, I mean, I might be able to help you. Like if you call me and ask me, but I also know this other person who did that professionally before they did martial arts and they're going to have a better answer, right? So we have like lots of resources for those people. And I think that's probably, when I think about you and like what got you to where you are today, I think there's two things that like stick out to me the most. Handsome. <laughs> Handsome is, is, is the asterisk one because that changes over time. But <laughs> it gets better. It gets better. It. Exactly. Like fine wine. The first one is like your dedication to education, right? And like, like you said, you're always reading, always in a mastermind, always doing something. And like, no matter where we went, I remember being as like a teenager, when no matter where we went on vacation and still now, like we visit whatever martial arts schools are in the area, right? We look, we walk into a Chipotle, we're thinking, looking at the design, looking at the staff, looking at the checkout process, right? Like we've, we design our life of looking around at different models and thinking, what can we take in that we can use for our own schools, right? It doesn't have to be a martial arts school. In fact, you probably don't want to copy most of the martial arts schools because they're kind of stuck in the past or still handcuffed by tradition. So we want to look at like what's happening right now so we don't end up as the next blockbuster. And the second thing is your ability to like and, and willingness to delegate, right? I think that's probably your probably your biggest skill set. Like the education is really important, but your ability to, to, to delegate and in an efficient way and finding the right people to do the right thing, 
right? You're not trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole, right? Like you're like finding people who are actually good at that one thing and be like, hey, can you do this? And when you do it, I think most people don't want to give up, give out power, but A, you're, you're very willing to give up like power or responsibility and control and because you're willing to find, you know how to find the right person to do it, right? So would, do you agree with that? Do you feel like those are some of your biggest skill sets? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm able to do that because, and, and people think sometimes that I'm just like being funny when I say that I'm not good at very many things. But, you know, all those people that you mentioned earlier, all their different skill sets, like I think that is one of my superpowers is recognizing other people's greatness and saying like, oh, you're way better at this than me, go do it. And I don't look at it like giving up power in any way. Like I look at it like, you know, you need this and this person needs this. Yeah, like I might be able to help a little bit, but this person is going to be way better. So if I want you to be successful, I need to help that. You know, the best way to do that is let you talk to this person. But I wanted to go back. You were like naming like doctors and engineers and stuff like that. That's like the other big giant mind shift. When we first when we first started expanding, we believed the system was everything. And the system would fix it all. You know, just say the right words and it'll be fine. And for a little bit that worked. But what we realized was character was huge. And we needed really, and we, in the beginning, it was like we were super cheap, right? So we would only want like the best people who would work for the least amount of money. So if somebody worked, you know, if somebody was just like standing there, didn't really have a job, I can hire you, say these words. What we discovered was that works a little bit, but works even better is if you find the best people that are super passionate and they are, you know, they're, they've already shown some level of accomplishment in some other part of their life. But the, the challenge for most schools is, okay, well, the person is a professor, they're a doctor, they're an engineer, they're an attorney, you know, they're whatever, they're a professional. Well, you can't say to that professional after all this schooling, hey, listen, I, I want you to do your passion job because you love martial arts and you want to teach, you want to help people. I can pay you 40,000 a year. You know, that person's already making hundred K minimum, right? So how are you going to, like, even if they want to, once they have their family and their mortgage and all that, they can't, impossible. So you need to have an opportunity where they can make really great money equal to any other profession. And that's, you know, one of my personal goals is that, and I talked about this the other day and you've heard me talk about it many times is I always use like the Jewish mother example. So, you know, obviously every Jewish mother, our mother, our mother, yeah, as a, but you know, Jewish she, mothers in general. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. In general, or maybe all moms in general, you, when they, when they're talking to their friends and they're bragging about their child and they're saying like, Oh, my daughter or my son's going to marry a doctor or an engineer. I want the, the other person to say, oh, my son's marrying a, a martial arts school owner or a head instructor and the doctor and an engineer one feels, oh, well, that's lucky. That's, you know, that's even mm. better, right? Like, and I think we can get there because we truly have done well, way more freedom than any other profession. Income can equal whatever you want it to equal. I'm making any earnings claims, by the way. And you know, you can actually like help people and just really make an impact, but also have that freedom in your life. Cause I think today people are very concerned and I think they should be like your, your, your business should not be holding you back from your life. Right? Like we're super lucky that we get to like help you. Like I love teaching, but I also don't want to have to teach, right? Like I, I, my favorite time teaching is when I don't have to teach. Like when I have to go teach a class, which it doesn't really happen, but is the least fun teaching the class when I, I, I get to like walk in and just do it because I love, you know, the expression on the kids or the adults faces when they have the, you know, the aha moment, or I help them get something better that I love. So anyway, having that, I think, and we have that, you know, action karate has that model and people want to have like a purpose in their life and they want to have freedom from, you know, instead of just like the constant grind. And, you know, we feel that we can provide that over the course of 12 to 24 months of them running their business. Mm, very cool. So, what would you say to someone who's a martial arts school owner? Maybe they have one location and that location is great. Maybe they're already doing well. They have the systems. They have great people. Those are like non-starters, right? They can't scale until they have those, right? And they have to have people who want to be able to have a career in martial arts, right? You can't just like, I think a lot of times people think, oh, I have one location. It's doing great. I'm just going to open up a second one. I'll make double the amount of money, but it never really works that way. Usually it's just like the same amount of money, but now twice the amount of responsibility. So you need to be able to have the people who are willing and want to do that. And like, you're really just giving them opportunity, right? So, so what would you say to someone who has one school? Let's say they have all those things, right? Like what advice you got to give them to be able to scale their organization? Well, the first thing I would say is I would ask them their why. 
Like what, you know, if you already have a solid location, you're already making good money, you have a good team, you know, I know plenty of people that have one location that crush it and they're totally happy. You know, maybe like the next step for them would like buy their own building, right? So just have a little bit more equity and have like a better retirement plan. But I would ask them first what their why is and what they want to do. Like for me, I love, love when our people tell us like how much money they make and all the vacations they went on. Like that is what jazzes me up, right? That's exciting for me. So that's my, that's part of my why, right? Obviously my daughter and my family are like my deeper, that kind of why. But anyway, I would just say like they need to, if they're going to do it themselves and not have like a partnership, you know, just, and if they already have everything documented, ready to go, I mean, they just have to like wait for people to ask them to do it and then create more instructor training. I mean, like our instructor training, we have something every month where we have, you know, 45 to 80 people show up to become, you know, our last enrollment director one, I think we had 50 or 60 people, maybe 80, I can't remember. And I was watching it thinking, what do we do with all these enrollment directors? Like we don't need enrollment directors, but you know, now we have to find a place for them and eventually they'll be turned into like school owners or, or our, or the current partners will use them to like get more freedom. But anyway, they have to just figure out an instructor platform that is going to just create more and more people that want to live that lifestyle and be showing it off like we do with vision casting and stuff. And I say show off, I mean like demonstrating. Mm, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on here. So if, if, if there's a school owner that maybe they're just kind of like by themselves and they would love to have be a part of like a bigger organization with like a strong vision of like really helping like a lot more people and have all the resources that we have. How do they get in touch with you or what website do they visit? I would think they would get in touch with you, sir, with uh, Double Your Dojo. <laughs> sure. Well, there's two different options they can go, right? If they wanted to be a, a part of a bigger, much bigger organization and like be a part of like a, a franchise, where would they go for that? Um, they could find me on LinkedIn, Solomon Brenner at something and or Facebook, or they can contact you and get a hold of me. I think if you just Google me, I'm not that hard to find. Cool. Um, you yeah, can find just- them on Facebook, Solomon Brenner. It, obviously, if you want the the resources and the help in order to grow your own martial arts location and where you're at, you can obviously reach out to me directly at Matthew Brenner at Black Belt Brenner one on Instagram or visit doubleyourdojo.com. So just so we know from where you're at right now. So when you first started to where you are now, so obviously you started with one school and now we're at 26 plus some plus some ones that are waiting to be sprouted into full time locations. What would you say like the estimate of like total revenue across all the locations are? Not to brag, but to like, so people like recognize the credibility. Uh, you know, some of the schools are still new. And again, from franchising, I can't really do like earnings claims, but I'm guessing like store-wide sales altogether. This is an estimate, right? Ten, Not ten. an earnings claim if you're an attorney listening. Yeah, like <laughs> I would say 10 to 13 million, you know, is probably across the board. Cool, cool. Well, thank you so much for being on here. And if you're listening to this and you and you want support, reach out to one of us directly. We'll help you. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me.